So yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity to speak at my first Urban Age conference. I hope it's the, the first of many. Um, and it's, I suppose, a, a challenge of, you know, the good thing coming on the second day is that uh, you get to hear what other people have to say and you get to tailor your, uh, your talk accordingly. The bad thing, of course, is that many people have already said some of the key things that I want to say. Um, but I hope what I will say, uh, really, it cuts across pretty much everything that we've been speaking about yesterday and today. So in some respects, I hope it ties it together. And I want to start with this, uh, this image. So I'm from Scotland. I live in Australia, but I'm from Scotland. I'm from Glasgow. And this is a, a picture from a, um, a gallery uh, in Glasgow that really was called Witness to Mortality. Uh, Glasgow has some of the best uh, parts of uh, ways of living. It also has some of the most depressing uh, parts of, uh, of a city life that I think you can possibly imagine. Um, and the idea of this notion of freedom, uh, if you recall the March of Sen, Nobel Prize uh, winning economist speaks about having the freedom to lead a life we have reason to value. So what is it, and I think what we've been speaking about is how do cities help uh, contribute to that freedom to lead a life we have reason to value. And because it's at the end of the day and we're exhausted having listened to, I think, some of the most stimulating discussions that I've heard for a long time, I thought I'd give you some of the key messages and then you can leave or go to sleep or do whatever you want. Um, so what, what am I going to talk about and what, what are the messages? Economic and social policies drive health inequities and urban health inequities. So I say that as a statement of fact, and I hope I'll uh, demonstrate that, but there really is a dearth of evidence that both quantifies uh, and really it makes explicit uh, the relationships between public policy, and I'm not talking just about health policy, I'm talking about public policy, on health inequities and some of the work of colleagues that we've heard about is really all about trying to to demonstrate that impact the danger of being small is that you can't see the screen <laughs> and death story. Um, we've spoken about governance uh, both implicitly and explicitly uh, yesterday and today and i would argue that the architecture of governance is still inadequate to address the complexities uh, of urban health inequities and that in an overall sense, if we are going to think about and do something about health inequity, then we're talking about the political economy of health. And we're all talking about how bad our cities are. Well, I, I'll claim this one for myself. From Glasgow, I'm from the working class area of Glasgow that's mentioned there. So men with a life expectancy of 54 years compared to a more affluent part of Glasgow with a life expectancy of 82. When we launched these data, and I'll speak about where these came from, um, when we launched these data, the media went ballistic. The notion that in Scotland and in Glasgow, this flourishing city, uh, that we have these sorts of differences. And for the footballers, well, the soccer, the real footballers, soccer uh, fans in the room, uh, if you follow Glasgow Celtic, you may remember Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns was one of the, the best footballers in the world. Um, he died at the age of 51. Four of his five siblings died under the age of 55, all from that part of, of Glasgow. What's happening? But there's a gradient, and this goes to the, some of the discussion we had earlier. Is it about targeting? Is it about universalism? If we only think about those marked uh, differences between the top and the bottom, we miss the fact that there's quite a significant burden, health burden or death burden, uh, somewhere uh, along the social gradient. Uh, and these, these data, I think, demonstrate that. If, if I press the red button, is that the pointer? Or am I going to? So yes, so the idea of thinking about both the differences but also uh, the gradient. So we might say there are differences in health, differences in death, differences in health. 
we started to have a conversation last night about what do we mean by health inequities. Well, if you're talking about inequities, to me, you're starting to talk about a value system. The notion of it's not just about difference and it's not just about inequality, but the fact that there is unfairness in those differences. And I had the privilege to work with the WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health and the report that we released in 2008 on the back cover said social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And one of the most, uh, one of the comments that we got about the Commission's report was it was ideology but with an evidence base, which we took as a great compliment. So yes, we laid bare that it was about social justice, it was about human rights, but that there was an evidence base that actually you could do something about that. And if for, for the many economists in the room, if you want an efficiency argument as to why you would do something about health inequities, it costs an awful lot of money to have them in the system. And I won't read through the, the figures. And then the argument, well, is it not about national wealth? Is that the important thing? If we want to do something about health and we want to do something about health inequities, is it about economic growth? If it was only about economic growth, then Costa Rica, Sri, um, Sri Lanka, Kerala would have nowhere near the life expectancy that they currently have. These are old data, but it makes the point that two countries with this very, very different uh, national wealth in terms of GDP per capita, has very similar life expectancy at birth. So there's something else that matters. And of course, I'm talking then about the social determinants of health as being uh, some of the key drivers uh, of those uh, health and health inequities. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's this combination of structural determinants, so power, money and resources, so matters of trade, matters of uh, labour arrangements around the world, that affect our everyday living conditions. And we've spoken an awful lot about everyday living conditions, so whether it's the physical built environment, uh, etc. And that combination of those more upstream structural factors with the daily living conditions contribute towards empowerment having enough material resource, having psychosocial control over our lives and having political voice and together contributing to health inequities. And if we might just demonstrate that differently, it's the combination of all of the things on the left hand side. If it's about having the freedom to lead a life that we have reason to value, empowerment, material, psychosocial and political uh, voice and control, is that what we mean by human development? And I'm afraid to put the next slide up, just based on the, the conversation I was having at lunchtime. But this notion of how do we, how do we value, what's a successful society? Uh, is it about the dollar sign? Why do we now read uh, every day? We think it's important that we read about the, the Dow Jones. Or, you know, we've got this psyche of the dollar being the most important outcome. But arguably, and we spoke about yesterday, subjective well-being. Maybe it's about the distribution of health. It could be a marker. So distribution of physical and distribution uh, of mental well-being. I'm not going to go into the daily living conditions, but suffice to say that they matter. Uh, I think we spoke about them an awful lot uh, yesterday and uh, many of the, the urban people in the room uh, know all of this uh, more than me. But it's socially graded just to remind us that the experience of the built and urban form is very socially graded and that's in England. So again, that steep social gradient, if we only focused on the bottom, we miss the fact that the next rung in the social ladder has a worse experience compared to the next rung in the social ladder that has a worse experience. So everybody's, everybody's part of this. And of course, I've got to speak about food. It's one of the areas that I do a lot of work in. Um, being from Glasgow, we have one of the highest levels of heart disease in the world. Uh, and one of the reasons is this picture on the left-hand side, which is the deep-fried Mars bar. And it's not an urban myth, and it actually tastes really quite nice. Uh, for those of you who don't know the deep-fried Mars bar, it's, you know, it's a chocolate bar with caramel on the inside. You wrap it in batter and you drip it, dop it, 
sorry, drop it into oil. And you buy it when you go into the, the fast food outlet as you buy your deep fried pizza. But the reason I put it up really is to talk about issues of availability, of affordability and of acceptability. The deep fried Mars bar along with the deep fried pizza is readily available. It's not an urban myth, it's on, in every fast food outlet in Glasgow. It's also very affordable. So compare, you know, if we're talking about buying the healthy foods when you go in and you've got this on offer and it tastes kind of nice, of course you're going to buy it. And then it's socially acceptable. It's now on the menu in the more affluent restaurants in the city of Glasgow. So we've changed the, nor we've, we've normalized this food to be something that we want to consume. And I don't think that's per chance. I spend a lot of my time fighting with the food processing industry who battle to get these sorts of foods into the shops. And we've got some of the levers, if we were to use some of the, the government and planning uh, levers through planning and the food service sector. But I do want to talk more about power, money and resources because I think this is really what shapes those daily living conditions within cities. Why do I think trade has anything to do with urban health inequities? Trade is a very important mechanism for economic development and certainly for many low and middle income countries where much of the urban growth is currently happening. Being part of the global trading system is vital for economic development, but it's the nature of the trade that's uh, important for health equity. But trade brings revenue for countries where the taxation system is not the primary source of public spending revenue. Trade is an important part of that. So the notion then of countries entering into trade agreements where they have to reduce their tariffs very significantly, which therefore means they reduce their public revenue spending capacity, has implications then for dealing with some of these social uh, and urban policies that we would like countries and cities to spend money on. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite far upstream in our thinking, but I would say from a political um, economy of health perspective, it's an area we need to think about. What about working conditions? I'm not advocating that everybody should have, uh, it should be wanting to buy the, the Big Mac. You can see there's a theme of food in my talks. Um, but so, of course, the Big Mac is the index. It standardizes uh, the price of food. So what, the, what this graph is showing is that the salaries in cities uh, in parts of the world are much less compared to other parts of the world. And that's, of course, not a big surprise. But the point of the slide is if we are thinking about urban health inequities and having enough material resource to lead a life we have reason to value, then thinking about the precariousness uh, of global labour arrangements and, our, and the everyday working conditions is also part of the arsenal uh, to address urban health inequities. But who's got the power in all of this? And this is coming to the issue of governance. And we've spoken, we've, we've had discussions about the top down, the bottom up approaches uh, to addressing health inequities. This is a sl um, a, an image from Fran Baum in Australia. It's not one or the other, it's a combination, of course. And I want to use this example of the cigarette plane packaging. We know that uh, cigarette uptake, smoking uptake happens in cities. It happens at an earlier age in cities and then that social contagion into rural locations. Australia is currently fighting from a public health perspective to I suppose, regulate uh, the, the, the branding on the, the, the package, on the tobacco package. The idea of having no logos on the cigarette packaging. Now, of course, that sent the tobacco industry into a frenzy uh, around the world. No logos, a question of are we in breach of intellectual property through the TRIPS agreement, so going back to trade. So it came from a health concern but took us into the trade uh, and investment world where for us in the public health community in Australia, we've struggled to deal with all of that you know, in terms of being equipped to have that sort of discussion. It will pass. At the moment, including Hong Kong and a number of other countries uh, around the world, Australia is going through the World Trade Organization's judicial system um, 
been uh, questioned as to uh, team a word. Um, but as I say, it's likely, very likely, that it'll pass. That'll be a major, major win for public health and will have huge implications uh, for urban health. What about the, who's got the power in terms of local planning? If you know, I lived in Ireland for a long time, and if you know the city of Dublin, and there's a part of Dublin called Temple Bar, uh, it's one, so Ireland went through you know, the Celtic Tiger, rapid uh, economic growth. What happened, I'll let you read, I don't, I don't want to read it all out, was the Irish government decided to just have all sorts of incentives around property development. And it happened in a way, and we're um, reaping the, not the rewards of it now, Ireland is in terrible trouble partly because of it, not exclusively. But what we saw happening in the centre of Dublin in this area called Temple Bar uh, was increase in crime rates and increase in uh, drinking on the streets. If you ever visit Dublin and visit Temple Bar area, it is just truly disgusting what happens in the evenings around. Now, I Ireland already had a problem with uh, alcohol, but it's now got an even uh, greater problem. And partly because the control of the local planning was taken out of the hands of the local planners. But there are, of course, good examples of real participatory governance where you have community involvement saying this is what we, the community, need in order to achieve uh, our desires in terms of health and social needs. The before and the after pictures of uh, favela in Brazil, uh, I took these slides from a colleague, which was based on community, so it was community driven based on the needs and desires of the community, funded by local government with input from private investment, a very, a demo, we were talking about democratic control yesterday. And it matters, it matters for health outcomes. This is indigenous control, urban youths in Canada. Down the left hand side is the suicide rates. And really the point of the slide is to show how it drops off with increasing community control. So the idea of self-determination, community controlled uh, and organized uh, services, we saw this incredible drop off in uh, youth urban suicide rates in Canada. So what do we need? We've set up this Global Action for Health Equity Network. That's a plug, we're online, please have a look. Um, what do we need to bring to me what, what I'm speaking about is all of these different sectors that affect uh, urban health. And the idea, it's very easy to say political will. On the right hand side is Gordon Brown, who was the Prime Minister at the time when we launched the Commission's report in 2008. The Prime Minister stood up and opened the conference. It wasn't the Minister for Health, it was the Prime Minister who said, at the centre of my government, I think uh, that health equity is something that we should be concerned with. And we are going to think about this in a whole of government approach. Yeah. How it plays out, of course, is very different. On the left hand side is not just a picture of um, a whole motley crew, um, but at the centre is the mayor of um, New Orleans. We were invited by the former Surgeon General of the US to come to New Orleans and expose the, after Hurricane Katrina, and expose the social fault lines. He said this was not about this natural disaster, the aftermath of that. It wasn't about the natural disaster, it was about the underlying social inequities. And the mayor, of, uh, the mayor of New Orleans, again, stood up and said, what we are trying to do is get the health care system together with the urban planning system, together with the nas natural disaster system people to talk together to do it in an integrated way. I don't think it's happened particularly well, but um, colleagues from the US will tell us otherwise. Central to all of this of moving forward is an explicit policy framework that puts health equity at the centre. It's not about saying we'll target this group or we'll target that group. It's right at the centre. What we want to do is address health, health inequities, and then let's work out how we do that. 
I spend a lot of, a lot of my work is around complex systems and how they produce health inequities and the idea of let's embrace the, the, uh, the complexity, please. Um, the call for ways of thinking about evidence uh, and modeling and so forth, absolutely. But this systematic consideration, so whether it's the health, uh, the health impact approach of systematically assessing what other sectors, what sectors are doing, but also thinking about the systems and processes. You know, the idea of how do systems reinforce issues of racism or issues of gender inequities? You know, some of these systemic social inequities that produce themselves in terms of or produce uh, the health inequities. And there's some very nice examples of how you might do that. I'll just give this example from South Australia. I won't speak it through, but if, if anybody's interested, that again came at the Premier's level, so the head of the government of South Australia, not the Department of Health, the head of government said, we want to do something about health, we want to do something about health inequities, we think it's part, it, it, we think it's a central issue for us. You ministers get around the table and work out how we do it. And to finish, the idea of the data. If we don't have the data, we don't have a problem and we don't have any action. And we're going to hear about some of that from colleagues now. But I would say there's a caveat to that. We know an awful lot uh, and we know about many of the things that can be done. So not having the data is not an excuse to not do something. So it's the two things. And I really just want to pick up on this the bit at the bottom. Asking the question differently, one of my concerns if we talk about uh, within health inequities is you know, why do the poor people behave, they behave the way they do, you know, the feckless poor, and it puts it back on to the, the poor. A question might, another way of asking that question is, well, why on earth are people poor in the first place? What is it about those structural inequities that are contributing to that? And to finish, what's really exciting for me in this room is the diversity of disciplines. I've truly, uh, I mean, I've learned a, a huge amount uh, yesterday and today, but it's also incredibly difficult to do, uh, you know, really working across disciplines. Uh, you know, the notion of we have interdisciplinary groups is just, I, I've yet to see that done really well. Uh, so how do we get all of these, these people together? Um, and this is, is a fantastic way to do it. So to, forget, to finish, and for my New Zealand colleagues in the room, um, this idea of you know, having the freedom to lead a life we have reason to value, I think uh, this writer from New Zealand sums up what I understood we were speaking about.